Good evening to each of you. Thank you for being here tonight and for the wonderful way that those in the auditorium have participated in our time of worship. We trust if you join us online or by conference call uh, that you also are participating as we uh, worship together. And I can think of no greater joy that the Lord affords us than to be able to do that as has been stated already. Uh, I do want to express my uh, appreciation to the uh, kind individuals that said uh, the lessons over the Back to the Bible workbooks were helpful. Uh, I won't identify the um, guilty, but um, I took it as a compliment. I trust that's how he meant. He said, I thought that was going to be a disaster. I just didn't know how it'd go, but it went well. You did good. And I said, well, I think that's one of those, you know, backhanded compliments. And that's okay. I like them backhanded, fronthanded, however you want to give them. Uh, those are uh, appreciated. But of course, the purpose of that was to remind us of what many of us already knew, but uh, to give us the confidence, I trust, to be able to share that uh, with others. And we did uh, each time, each of the four Sundays, um, we had visitors. Others uh, had maybe been exposed to some of that, but some of it uh, maybe had not stuck, so to speak. And those visitors may be exposed for the very first time to the simplicity of the gospel truth. And so uh, we continue to pray that God's word will find uh, in their heart, a place to grow and uh, that they will indeed in time and with continued encouragement and teaching uh, be obedient to the gospel. So uh, let's continue to work even uh, toward that end. Tonight, uh, we announced back in January that we would look at first things first on Sunday nights. And uh, then the, in February, we were away the first Sunday night, so we had to skip. So we're back on that series here on the first Sunday night. And uh, first things first, uh, I like uh, this quote that uh, Lewis uh, in one of his, I forget which of his writings, uh, this was found maybe in one of his lectures. Uh, he said, put first things first and we get second things thrown in. Put second things first and we lose both first and second things. It's part of a larger argument he's making, but I, I think that's true. God wants to, us to appreciate the first things in his word. And those are many and varied. And we're just picking out nine or ten, maybe eleven. Uh, I'm not sure. I think there'll be a time, a couple more times maybe this year when I won't be able to do this on the first Sunday nights. But you remember we went back to the Old Testament in January and looked at that widow. And uh, that widow who had nothing, but Elisha said, you trust God and I'll see that God supplies you and he blesses you and he meets the needs that you had. And so that was just a very basic introduction to how we trust God. Uh, tonight I invite you to turn to the book of Hebrews. And as we turn to the book of Hebrews, I want you to notice with me uh, the last three verses of chapter 5, especially. Beginning in Hebrews chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For, verse 13, everyone who partakes of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You've read those passages before, those verses, and you know what the Hebrew writer is warning us about. Really, to put it very simply, he said, the choice is yours, your spiritual diet. Is it going to be milk or meat? Which do you prefer? Now, I know all of us perhaps enjoy a good cold glass of milk uh, from time to time, but if you were to give me the choice, I'd prefer the T-bone or whatever cut that is, maybe a porterhouse or some other, a big steak off the grill every time, and maybe you would too. The problem uh, is where... We didn't even consider, because purposefully I wanted you to listen to what verses 12 to 14 gave us by way of instruction. But what prompted the Hebrew writer to give them this caution and this warning? Why is he expressing what I think is a, a level of some disappointment? Now, before we look at that, let me go ahead and tell you that there is certainly no shame in uh, our early maturity and our early attempts at growth in our Christian faith and in our relationship with God. That is, uh, as we begin to serve the Lord, as all of us must when we obey the gospel, milk is what is needed. And the reason why, of course, the metaphor that he's using here, the Hebrew writer, whoever it is, uh, it certainly accords with what is used elsewhere in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 and following, Paul said, I needed to feed you with milk. You weren't ready for anything more involved, more detailed, more uh, strenuous and uh, more difficult to understand. You needed the basics, in other words. And 
Every baby today, uh, we start them with milk. That's the basics. Uh, their little digestive systems would not have any use whatsoever for the T-bone steak. Likewise, Peter in 1 Peter 2 verse 2 said, Desire the sincere milk of the word in order that you may grow thereby. And so I know tonight there is in this audience uh, those who have been Christians for less than five years and some, uh, I guess, even less time than that. Maybe even uh, some, I think, probably less than even a couple of years. And it is certainly the case and is perfectly acceptable for you at this point to say, well, I'm still on the milk. I I'm still trying to learn the basics. I I'm getting it down. I'm making an effort to study, but I'm not ready yet for those deeper things. That's okay. The caution is not for you, although this lesson will be helpful to you as we go through it in helping you understand how to gravitate from that milk to stronger meat. That is from the basics to that which is more advanced, if you will. But here's the problem for all of us, no matter of our uh, age spiritually, and it's not even a problem as it relates to our physical age necessarily. Look at verse 11. The Hebrew writer says, I have much to say. And he's talking about Melchizedek. I'm not going to even broach that topic because he won't revisit it again until chapter 7. It's integral to the argument being made in this book, but Melchizedek's an Old Testament character. And the Hebrew writer says, I have a lot to say about him and how he relates to Jesus. And it's hard to explain. I appreciate the Bible does not tell us that it is uh, easy in all cases, in all uh, subject matters uh, to simply just be able to absorb by osmosis what the Bible teaches. It takes work. Second Peter chapter 3, Paul is mentioned by Peter. And he says, does Peter, in reference to Paul, he writes things that are difficult to understand. And you study the book of Romans in depth, for instance, and you'll appreciate that Peter knew what he was talking about. Indeed, some things are hard to understand. This Melchizedek matter relating to Jesus is hard to explain, but here's why it was especially difficult. The Hebrew writer says, since you have become, notice please, dull of hearing. Dull of hearing. Now you hear that word dull and you say, that means not sharp. Well, how does your ear have any sharpness to it? It relates to how inattentive they were, how lazy they were in their hearing, really. They were slow. One version says you're hard of hearing. That doesn't mean that the volume is reduced. I know uh, I said this was not a physical matter. As we age, typically hearing is one of those senses that diminishes and declines. And uh, that's just the natural order of things, thankfully. Hearing aids and other things sometimes help mitigate against that. But this isn't a physical problem. This is a spiritual problem. These people had refused to listen, to pay close attention. And so tonight, I don't know other than just by looking at you, as you look at me, are you listening? Uh, that's something that you must determine. God knows if you are or not. But if you are, then this lesson will help you hopefully move on and mature. Notice beginning in verse 6, he begins. And again, there were no chapter divisions originally. Uh, it's my opinion that actually the book of Hebrews is... I think a recorded sermon, that is, that it was dictated as someone preached it, and then they went back and kind of wrote it out. Uh, I just think it flows that way. So without the chapter and verse divisions, therefore, and that word is the key conjunction tying what I've just said. Now the Hebrew writer says in verse 1 of chapter 6, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. And so his, his warning here and his rebuke, his reprimand, is that they did not know the rudimentary things, the elementary, basic, simple things of God's Word. Really, the terminology that he's using here when he says the first principles of the oracles of God, uh, what the original readers would have heard, or when they read it, what they would have understood, uh, is very akin to what we would say today. You don't know your ABCs. Your ABCs, the basic things. Uh, you know the little guy that came home from his first day at kindergarten. Mom said, what'd you learn? He said, well, my ABCs. Well, that's good, honey. No, I've got to go back tomorrow and start with D. You know, we have to keep going. Uh, we can't just learn uh, the basics. We have to go forward. These readers, these hearers, and maybe too often today, we have people that are spiritual Peter Pans. And you remember Peter Pan? Uh, the boys uh, remember that. That was one of their theatrical performances in years past. But uh, Peter Pan is the boy who will not grow up. 
And spiritually speaking, there are Christians who kind of take that approach. I'm just going to be a spiritual Peter Pan. I don't want to grow up. And so their development is arrested. Uh, they have no spiritual teeth to chew on the meat of God's word as it is. And here the Hebrew writer is telling them to leave. Leave. Notice uh, again verse 1. Leaving the discussion. That's the past. Go on to perfection. Look to the future. And the idea is that they move swiftly with energetic movement. Now, the author is probably especially chiding uh, those who were acquainted before they became Christians and maybe not just acquainted, but also participants in the religion of Judaism. It may be that these were uh, individuals who, of course, by the name of the book itself, Hebrews, uh, those that were participants in the Jewish faith prior to obeying the gospel. If so, then he's telling them, your need is especially acute that you go on, that you don't fall back, that you do not turn again to what you left. And the book of Hebrews will argue uh, conclusively and exhaustively uh, that Jesus is better, better than Moses, better than the angels, better than the Old Testament law, better than the Old Testament priesthood, better than the system of worship in the tabernacle and temple. Jesus is better. And here, almost uh, smack dab in the middle of the book, he's telling them, these things that were basic that you even learned in Christianity, it's not enough to stop there either. And so tonight, let's think about uh, these things and let's look at them. He says that we ought to go on and not lay again the foundation. These are the first things first that we're going uh, to look at. If you build a foundation, that's great. Uh, you start with your uh, foundation, you have to make sure that it's right. Jesus said as much in Matthew 7, didn't he? The wise man built his house on the rock so that when the rain came, the floods rose and the winds beat. And all of that happened in the storms. It was founded on the rock. Its foundation was secure. Build your house on the sand, it'll go splat in the storm. So the foundation is important, but if you just stop at the foundation, you don't have much of a dwelling, much of a building, much of a house. And so we have to go on. What are these things that we need to go on from? Again, you may say, well, I've been a Christian 50 years. If you have been, you should be able to teach this lesson just as well as I can. You ought to be able to, if not by memory, at least uh, in content, be able to say, okay, here's what this means. This repentance from dead works, here's what it means if someone were to ask you. And now, I'm not going to put a magical number and say, well, he said 50, so I've been a Christian 45 years, so he's not talking to me yet. Maybe the next five years I'll get to that point. Mature. Grow. Listen. Don't be dull of hearing. Move past these first things. For those that are younger, more immature, these are things that you need to kind of ground yourself on. These are the foundational things, at least that the Hebrew writer thought was important to have a good grasp on. And then you move on to a, I won't say a better, because all of God's Word is good for discussion and study and growth and obedience, but you grow into a bigger more mature and capable Christian in handling the Word of God properly. But here are things. Notice first, in verse 1, he said, We don't lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now this um, even combination of terms, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, might be meant by the reader to be one and the same. Meaning, instead of differentiating between the two, he's saying repentance and faith go together. I know that uh, because Jesus combined the two in Mark 1 verse 15. He said, repent and believe in the gospel. That was the content of Jesus' first sermon. You're probably saying, well, that'd be a good sermon for you. That's short and sweet. We'd get out of here quicker. Repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. There was more to, I'm sure, our Lord's first sermon than that. But you see, these go together. Whether they're uh, one and the same or differentiating, I don't know that it really matters. We're going to treat them separately tonight. And then there are four pair or uh, four other things, two pairs of two that we'll look at in verse two momentarily. Well, repentance, what is that? It is that U-turn. As we spoke of this morning, it's changing my mind and changing my actions. It's not simply a an, and I'm sorry for being caught doing something I should not do. I'll be more careful not to get caught the next time sort of scenario. It's actually changing my mind completely about what I did and understanding it's not what God would have me to do, so I'm going to change. Luke chapter 13, it's presented to Jesus about the uncertainties of life. A tower falling on some as they were constructing it. Pilate, in a political 
uh, act of chicanery, if you will, uh, took and murdered some innocent Jewish citizens to kind of, um, you know, solidify his power and his reign of terror over the people. And Jesus is questioned about, you know, why do things like that happen in life? And Jesus is dismissive in one sense. I'm not saying he wasn't caring. Certainly he was. Uh, but here is his response, and he makes it twice for our benefit. Verse 3 that you see on screen, and again in verse 5, the same words found when Jesus said, I tell you no. And that's probably, I tell you, instead of thinking about these things and the uncertainties of life and the vicissitudes of how you know, things happen and we don't explain them or cannot understand them, Jesus said, no, but except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. And life happens that way and death is coming for us all. And Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. Not just physically die. That's certainly a coming to all of us. And we know the certainty of it. But repentance is essential. Verse 5, again, the same words are spoken. And so repentance, Jesus said, is essential. Acts 3 and verse 19, Peter's second gospel sermon. We look at his uh, sermon in chapter 2. And we try to dial, dial in every little detail about it. And we should uh, because it's so important on the day of Pentecost. Sometime later, on Solomon's porch in the temple, again Peter preaches, and this time verse 19 is the summation, the climax point of that sermon, when he said, Repent, therefore, and be converted. Repent, therefore, and be converted. There is attitude and there is action, and there must be a change in both in order for one to be a Christian. So tonight, uh, that's something that you must understand. These dead works, what are they? It's possible that here this... Uh, Emphasis to the Hebrew hearers is especially on the things that they may have done in Judaism. The law keeping, the feast, the sacrifices, all of those ordinances uh, that the Old Testament makes mention of that they were still wanting to try to hold on to and maybe even try to mesh with, incorporate into Christianity, notably circumcision. Acts chapter 15 is the discussion about that issue. The Hebrew writer says those dead works, they have no efficacy, they have no merit. They have no benefit to you as it relates to your standing before God. Instead, faithful obedience to the gospel is what matters uh, tonight. Could it also be sinful type works? Certainly it could. Uh, things that we do just to serve ourselves or our flesh instead of the spirit in imitation of Jesus Christ is of no benefit. But we're all guilty of that from time to time. Whatever those sinful deeds are, turn from them. Faith will always produce works that are living. James chapter 2 tells us it's not enough to say, I have faith. Well, what good does that do if your brother knocks on your door and he's hungry and he needs clothing? Well, I've got faith. Be warmed and filled. You shut the door in his face. That's not what faith does. Faith acts. And so he says, repentance from dead works and of this faith toward God. Well, what is faith toward God? The Hebrew writer defines the term. If you'll turn a few pages over in your Bible, you know exactly where I'm going. To Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 1 tells us, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've read that all my life, and I still scratch my head sometimes and say, what is he really talking about? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, there have been those who say, well, faith is believing in something even though you can't see it and have no evidence for it. That's, that's not what that means. That's not at all what that is. Now, faith is the substance of things that we are hoping and longing for. It's believing in them even though we don't have the tangible evidence before us. Uh, there is a component of it. But if we allow the Bible to be its own best interpreter, he'll go on to tell us by faith. And then he begins in verse 3 to detail. The worlds were formed or framed by the word of God. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Noah, being warned by God, things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. By faith, Sarah conceived. By faith, all of these things happen. Now, how did those things happen? Those things happen because the people uh, that are applauded and enshrined here in this hall of fame of faith, if you want to call it that, were those who listened to what God said they trusted it, and then in response to show their trust, they obeyed whatever he asked them to do. And that's still true tonight, and that's still what we must do. Uh, Jesus said it this way in John 8, 24, Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You have to believe, you have to trust me that I am, and am in fact, the Son of God, that my identity is certain. He didn't expect them to believe that without proof or works or evidence. 
But he certainly provided that to them, so he said, believe that. One more thing before we read, or rather leave, Hebrews chapter 11. If you look down to verse 30, every verse in the chapter, every verse in God's book is right and true, of course. But verse 30 is one of my favorites. Because you and I will encounter, even as we spoke of this morning, individuals that talk about faith. And they'll talk about their faith is effective in their standing before God in so much as they just simply say, I believe God saved me and that's it. Well, what did you do in response to believing that? Or did you take any steps of obedience as God's word commands? And some of them will be very, uh, they'll be very unapologetic and say, no, I just believed. Look at verse 30. By faith, so that's something that we're interested in and that's something that all of us affirm and they would too. The walls of Jericho fell down. And we remember that story, most of us, from VBS and Sunday school many years in the past. They were encircled for seven days. And on that seventh day, when the command came for the people to shout, the trumpets to be sounded, in fact, the walls did fall down. But I left a word out. You might underline it, you might circle it, you might highlight it. Notice, please, verse 30. By, the walls of Jer uh, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after... That is a crucial word, isn't it? After. What is faith toward God? Faith toward God is believing what God has said. Joshua, and then Joshua to the people. God says, this land of, Jer this land of Canaan, this city of Jericho, the first stop, is ours. But it's a great fortified city. How are we going to defeat that? We don't have any bulldozers or weapons to overcome uh, this great enemy. Here's what you do. For six days, march around the city one time. On the seventh day, march around seven times. What good would it have done for the people to remain in the camp and say, we believe God. Yep, he'll knock it down. That's what he said. I'm not going to walk out there in the sun. It's hot. I'm tired today. I've got other things to do. The walls would have still stood, of course. But when they obeyed and the walls fell down after they were encircled. Romans 10 verse 17, uh, of course, plays into this discussion. Faith comes by hearing. We state that as, you know, a fundamental beginning point in our relationship with God. We have to hear and know something about Him in order to believe. And the Hebrew writer uh, here says this faith toward God certainly accords with what Paul told the Romans. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. When I hear God's Word, when I read it, when I study it, when I come to know and have information about God and who He is, then my faith can develop, grow, and flourish. And here, as we leave verse 1, these are fundamental things. These are your ABCs of Christianity. Changing my attitude and action, instead of living for myself, I'm going to live for God because I have faith and believe in Him that He is who He says He is and that He will do what He says He'll do when, he, when I do as He's instructed me to do. Now notice, please, verse 2. Some of these further ABCs. And we'll go through these rather rapidly, but this is just basic. Again, uh, those who are... Uh, mature in their faith, they're eating meat. They've already moved past this. You may say, well, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I'm still growing. That's good. Keep growing. Keep learning. Developing. Move past these basics. But here, uh, this is milk material almost in one sense. I'm not saying that to say it's unimportant. Certainly, it's very important. But these are things that are basic and fundamental that we need to get a good grasp on. So let me give you a way to do that with each of these four. Uh, very quickly tonight, and hopefully you can commit this uh, somewhat even to memory and grow in your understanding of it. First, of the doctrine of baptisms. Uh, I love baptism pictures. This is my buddy uh, Daniel Gaines. He preaches up in South Central uh, Kentucky when he's not in uh, Tanzania, and uh, this is uh, him baptizing uh, his son. I think that was last, uh, maybe Wednesday night or the uh, week before last Wednesday night, so uh, I rejoice with them uh, in that happy occasion. Is this, notice, the doctrine of baptism, the reference to a Jewish or to a pagan ritual? Because it's in the plural. You may have a version, uh, I don't know, that even says the doctrine of washings. And you can translate the word that way, especially if you're referring to a Jewish practice. Uh, the Jewish religion, especially for those who are not born Jews, but decided to become Jews uh, and proselyte to the faith, as it was called, and they were subjected to ritual washings of all sorts. Uh, if you've ever read in a commentary about a mikvah, or if you've ever uh, just picked up a, a book and it said something about a mikvah pool, that's what it's talking about, a Jewish washing. And they would just wash their bodies 
Uh, some rabbis said to do it seven times. Some said to do it another number of times. But whatever it is, that might be what the Hebrew writer is saying. You're trying to incorporate this Jewish way of, uh, you know, of keeping these ceremonies in with your Christianity. It could also be that writing, as he was, to the Mediterranean world, uh, the encounter with pagan religions, uh, the Gentile mystery religions, as they were called, they had uh, ceremonies where they would wash uh, and some of them were quite eccentric. I, I'll spare you the details about that if you want to. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And they might have been trying to incorporate that into Christianity. Uh, that's a possibility. But in the New Testament, certainly the Hebrew writer accords with, again, what the rest of Scripture teaches. And what we know tonight is uh, there is one baptism. In Ephesians 4, verse 5, that's stated unequivocally, one baptism. And so Paul tells us that there is only one that is valid or operative. Whether he wrote first or whether the Hebrew writer recorded these words before the book of Ephesians is an unanswerable question. It really doesn't matter. They're not in conflict with each other. The Hebrew writer is not saying doctrine of baptisms as if there were multiple ones that were binding or valid. Rather, he says, leave that behind. Teach the gospel on this matter. And that says that there is one. And that one that we discussed at length this morning found in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. For those who know who Jesus is know what Jesus did, and know what Jesus offers, and desires the forgiveness of sins, they repent and are baptized. That's what Peter said to do. That's the message from heaven. Uh, we see no reason to change or alter that in any way uh, tonight. And so this act uh, of baptism is both vital and purposeful in order to receive this forgiveness. Notice I did not say uh, it is in any way a meritorious act. I'm not baptized and thus um, force God to save me or to forgive me. I do not put God in my debt, but I am simply accepting of the offer of his gift of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And I show my acceptance of that gift by complying with the instructions he gives me to receive it. And that's what baptism is, that culminating step, again, comparing or paralleling the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Number two, in verse six, he said, we need to leave behind. It's an elementary principle. It's a foundational matter. So let's move on. Let's go to the meat of God's word and move past the laying on of hands. Now, this is, um, I guess I could have come up with other pictures, but I didn't want to kind of pollute your mind with some of that. Uh, you've seen some of this if you've watched late night cable television uh, where there are still modern day guys who claim that they are able in some way by the transferring of their hands or by laying on of their hands certain blessings. Uh, in, the New, in the New Testament and in the Old, in the Bible as a whole, laying on of hands, which just I, that idea, I'm going to take my hands and put them on you. Sometimes it was put on the shoulder, sometimes actually on the head area. It was used to ordain, to bless, to transfer power. Uh, Exodus 29, verse 19, the Old Testament priest, Aaron and his sons, would take the sacrifice and they would, the Bible says, lay their hands on the animal. That was practical, of course, if you're going to get the animal up onto the altar where it would be sacrificed. But uh, they would also do that in different ceremonial type aspects. Uh, the scapegoat, for instance, on the Day of Atonement, they would lay their hands and they would confess over that animal the sins of Israel. And then it would be sent out into the wilderness. Well, what was that for? Was it for show in the sense? Well, yes, it was a figurative, symbolic uh, gesture. And so uh, that's something that happened. Uh, Genesis 48, verse 14, we see that the blessing oftentimes that a father would give his sons would be transferred, as it were, it seemed, as he neared death. Uh, here, in that case especially, uh, you remember that Isaac, uh, as it, or Jacob, is trying uh, to bless the sons of Joseph and the older son. Uh, he is replaced as Jacob crosses his hands with Ephraim and Manasseh. I won't give you all the details, but uh, Joseph's a little upset. Dad, that's not the way you do it. Bless them the other way. Put your hands in a different way. But he crossed his hands. And there's probably some purposeful reasons to that. Matthew 19, verse 13, the Bible says that the people brought to Jesus the children that he might lay his hands on them. It's a beautiful thing to try to imagine how friendly and kind and loving Jesus was. Jesus was not a sour guy, folks. He was fun in the sense of he was loving, he was kind, he was gracious. The children felt comfortable being in his presence and he laid his hands on them. Certainly Mark 6 verse 5, just one occasion of many others where the Bible says Jesus laid his hands on those that were sick and he healed them. Now how did he do that? Some way, again, the transferring of power. Now, he didn't have to do that, of course. Sometimes he just told somebody what to do, and they did it, and they were healed. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes he made, you know, a mud pie and put that on their eyes. There's a lot of different ways that Jesus uh, healed, but at least on one occasion, or on several occasions, he did it by putting hands on them. Acts 6, verse 6, the, uh, the elders, which also kind of parallel and maybe work in step with the apostles in the church at Jerusalem, take and select those men, we sometimes call them the first deacons, but men to take care of the Grecian widows. And they ordain them to the task. And ordain is not, you know, a word that simply means other than appoint them. Laying their hands on them and praying them and saying, guys, this is now your task, your duty, your responsibility. So that's one idea of laying on of hands. Probably, though, the Hebrew writer might, in fact, though, be referencing the transfer of the gift, miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know that with absolute certainty. But when he says the laying on of hands, had there been controversy about that issue? In fact, there had been. If you go back to Acts chapter 8, verse 14, you remember after the gospel was preached in Samaria, Peter and John are dispatched from Jerusalem to go down so that they might receive uh, the Holy Spirit. It had fallen on none of them. Yes, they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but it seems here, uh, especially after verse 17 tells us, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. This was enabling them perhaps to do some of those miraculous deeds that the Spirit would empower I know that because that guy named Simon, the sorcerer, the magician, the trickster that we were introduced to in verse 9, had tricked the people for a lot of years. But when he saw what happened with what Peter and John did, he recognized this is the real thing. This is amazing. And so you remember his request. Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Hey, I, I wouldn't have to trick people if I had this ability. This is the real deal. Peter said, your money perish with you. You thought the gift of God could be perished with money. You have no partner, lot in this matter. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. You know, you've got the wrong idea altogether. You better repent and pray. And so this idea of the laying on of hands may have this idea. Now, what that helps us see, of course, in a very easily understood way that so many people uh, even till tonight they're confused about and you'll find people say well I can work miracles I can I've had people actually uh, say something to that effect to me uh, I remember uh, one of Amy's uncles who preached in New Orleans if you've been to New Orleans there's a lot of strange folks there but uh, he was on the radio and then the guy that had him the radio program thereafter uh, he claimed that he said I can raise anybody from the dead and he said that for several weeks, and finally Amy's uncle called his bluff, and he said, let's go down to Jackson Square. There's a few dead people down there, and uh, they had a big gathering. Guess who didn't show up? Guy on the radio, and he never went back on either. You know, we don't have power like that. Uh, that miraculous ability was granted in the first century to the apostles so that they could speak the word of God. The scriptures were not yet even written so that they could testify that the power uh, that they possessed was from God to confirm that word. And when these men... Uh, in whatever way that God directed them to share that gift with others that they passed it on to, then they were able to do that, but that could be passed no further. And so when did those miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, when did they cease? Did they continue to the present hour? Most certainly not. When the apostles died, then the ability to transfer that power likewise died. That's what Acts chapter 8 is all about. And then what happened? We suppose perhaps that some of these in Samaria and other places who received these gifts, what happened when they died? Well, then the gift of the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way that uh, could affect, you know, the healing or the prophecy or the other things that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, that too likewise ceased. Uh, that's a fundamental matter. It's one over which, again, there is much confusion in the religious world, but there doesn't need to be. The Hebrew writer said that's milk. Move on past it. Let's go quickly now and look at the last two. The Hebrew writer says it's fundamental, it's basic, but you need to move on from the resurrection of the dead. It's a fundamental matter. Now, it's still quite amazing. I uh, brought both of those up to you. I guess that's okay. Jesus promised and clarified that this would be something that would, in fact, occur even before his own resurrection. John 5, 28 and 29. Don't be surprised. That's what Jesus said. Don't be marveling the hour is coming in which all, A-L-L, -L, not some, not just the righteous. That's uh, the whole premillennial uh, foolishness. No, all that are in the graves will hear his voice and come for, for it. They that have done good are the resurrection of life. But they that have done evil, yes, also do a resurrection, but a resurrection of condemnation. The resurrection will happen. Every grave will be emptied. John 14, verse 19, Jesus said, Because I live, you will live also. 
That's a wonderful assuring promise for those who are trying to live as the Lord teaches. It's a fundamental thing that we understand the resurrection of the dead. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10, even for those who were perhaps shrouded in, again, Gentile paganism, or those who were obscured by even the shadowy mentions of these things in the Old Testament, Paul said that Jesus brought light or brought to light life and immortality through the gospel. And it's a fundamental truth that Jesus and His resurrection is the guarantee of ours. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 is about. From verse 1 to verse 58, Jesus was raised, I will be raised. If Jesus was not raised, I won't be raised. But thanks be to God, uh, He was. It may be, in fact, that we're somewhat unbalanced in our teaching. What I mean by that is... We stress Jesus' death. Is that something to be stressed? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And, we don't need to forget, He was raised. He was raised for our justification, for our salvation on the third day according to the Scriptures. So we need to balance both. So the resurrection. Do you have questions? You might say, well, we don't understand how that will happen. We don't know what it will look like. We don't know when it will happen. All of that's true. But the basic premise is of its occurrence is a certainty. It's a fact uh, universally that it will. Then finally, here's an ABC. And it's one that I think that's appropriate to end on. A basic teaching of God's word is eternal judgment is coming. Eternal judgment awaits us all. The Hebrew writer tells us in chapter 9 verse 27, all people will die. And then the judgment. It's certain again, no doubt about it. Many people believe it's coming. Uh, You ask people uh, today, even those who are irreligious, do you think there's a day when we'll have to answer for how we've lived? Most people sure uh, say, I think so. Well, they have unfortunately a misunderstanding about it. They don't really see the basis uh, of uh, the death of Christ and how that plays into that event. They don't understand the resurrection of Christ and how that gives us hope on that day. They don't understand that forgiveness of sins is essential in order to be approved by God on that day. No, many people say, well, the judgment, that's that time when, you know, God just looks at and he kind of tallies up and says, okay, you did a hundred good deeds in your life and good for you. You only did 99 bad things. So, hey, you've got one more good than bad. Come on in. Heaven's your home. That's not the basis of that judgment. That's not how it's going to work. We spoke of this morning at length in Revelation chapter 20. My name has to be put in the book of life. And that book of life contains the name of those who live according to this book. And so we have to understand and prepare uh, accordingly. Uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, or 2 Corinthians 5, excuse me, verse 10, that we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each one will receive uh, the things that he's done in his body, whether good or evil. And then verse 11, we sometimes forget to read Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We need to persuade people in expectation of judgment. Don't reject God's love. Don't uh, don't forget that there will be punishment for sin. And then finally, notice verse 3. It seems odd, but it's a part of this context. This we will do. We'll move on from first things. Tonight I've given you basic. You may say, well, basic, it took a long time to get through. Well, these are basic things. You can build on them for sure. Milk or meat, which are you going to choose? The Hebrew writer says, this we will do if God permits. Will you grow? Will you mature? Will you understand? Will you have your faith strengthened uh, so that when someone asks you about that hope in you, you're able to explain? Are they even worse than ask? Maybe they accost you and accuse you and try to attack you. Why do you believe such nonsense as that as it relates to whichever of these topics? And in a very kind and gentle way, you say, I believe that because that's what the Bible teaches. Can I show you that? You take them to God's Word to show them. If God permits here, I don't think, is stated as a condition as if there is doubt or uncertainty. The impetus is on God doing His part, and He will certainly do that. And now it's our responsibility to do our part. And the choice remains for you and for me tonight. Which do you like? You want milk or meat? I like a cold glass of milk, but I can't live on that all the time. I need a little meat. I need something more on that. And tonight, as spiritual, mature people, we need more than just the milk of His Word. Yes, it's good to be reminded. Yes, the fundamentals must be stressed. But there's a time to move on. There's a time to dig deeper. There's a time to look at the things that are even more glorious in God's Word as He unfolds uh, His will to us and as we see uh, the beauty of it in its greater depth. And that's a lifelong pursuit. Now, please don't misunderstand and say, well, is he saying if I keep studying, there's a time when I'll know all I need to know? No, 
He's not saying that. He's saying it's rich to keep studying God's Word, to keep feeding on the meat of His Word. And I hope we can do that even together as we've done tonight. You've seen this slide before, and uh, certainly baptism, as we said, we've just touched very, on the very basics of it. We see its importance. Uh, these, I think, five words help us understand what it is, a burial, who it's for, believers, uh, what it's effective for. That is, before my sins are forgiven, I must engage uh, in this act. It is for a new birth, and it is where the blood of Christ is found. And thus, forgiveness is also found therein. Tonight, maybe something was said this morning uh, that prompted you to think, and maybe you've done further study, and maybe tonight is the time when you say, I, I need to do that. I, I need to do what we talked about. I need to become a Christian. I need to do what those in Acts chapter 2 did, and be obedient to the gospel, and repent and be baptized. Tonight, as a child of God, as a Christian, these ABCs, do you know them? I'm not going to give you a test. That would be tempting uh, just to say, you know, what did you know? What did you learn? If I did that next week, how much would you remember? Uh, we're not going to do that. But God knows, and he knows whether milk or meat is the diet that you choose spiritually as you live for him. Uh, you need the meat because you need to be stronger because the devil's attacking us every day. And it may be uh, that in his attacks against you and your faith, you, you've let him win. You've let him uh, maybe weaken you, maybe cause you to be indifferent to God's will. Maybe you've not served him with the desired uh, fervor that uh, you know you need to, as he expects from you. Uh, as we said this morning, we want to help folks. We want to help each other. We want to love each other physically. We want to love and help each other spiritually. And the wonderful uh, Word of God helps us do that so well. Tonight, if we can help you in that way, please make that known to us if you'd come as we stand and sing together. <laughs>